Hello, everyone, and welcome to Taboo Topics and Parkinson's Disease. This is a monthly webinar where we explore topics with stigma attached to them and try to normalize the conversation. My name is Maggie Ivancy, and I am the Center Coordinator and Clinical Social Worker at UNC Chapel Hill's Parkinson's Foundation Center of Excellence and Cure PSP Center of Care. And I'm really glad that you've been able to join us today. Uh, just a reminder that all participants um, will be muted in this webinar format, but we encourage you to use the chat feature to ask your questions, and we will have time for some Q&A at the end of our presentation today. Our topic today is death and dying, and our presenter, Dwan Kelsey, is the Associate Director of Education and Hospice Nurse Practitioner with Transitions Life Care. So Dwan, thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing about this topic that for many um, we avoid or we don't engage in talking about on, on a daily basis. So, so thank you for sharing with us today. No, thank you, Maggie, for the opportunity um, to share. This is a, a wonderful topic um, to talk about. And I use the term wonderful very loosely because this is something that I do on a daily basis. Um, however, I see the results of when this conversation happens, the wonderful results that can happen when we start to have these, co these difficult conversations. So thank you again for, uh, for, for inviting me. Yeah. Um, are you able to share um, your slides or would you like me to? You can, you can do that. Okay. Thank you. I'll do it. Yes. Let me pull these up real quick. Here we go. While she's pulling them up, I'll start by just saying, um, as, Meg, as Maggie said, I am the Associate Director of Education at Transitions Life, Life Care, but I would also like to add that I, I am also a practicing nurse practitioner at Transitions Life Care as well. So I definitely understand the, understand the work from a provider and from a practical um, standpoint um, in patients' homes, in we know wherever they are um, in the hospital. So um, I just wanted to add that from a clinical perspective, um, I can definitely speak to that um, as well. Next slide. So I just wanna start it off a little bit about talking about what is Parkinson's disease. And I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time, but I think it's important for us to kind of really understand exactly what we are talking about. So then we'll understand the whys to the conversation and to the um, ultimately to those goals of care and particularly if it leads to palliative care or a hospice um, referral. So Parkinson's disease is no more than a progressive neurodegenerative disorder that causes the dopamine levels to drop. I, I wrote in here, I wanted to add what is dopamine because we always hear, oh, when the dopamine drops, you know, that's Parkinson's. But then we need to kind of understand what is dopamine. And dopamine is no more than a hormone. It is a neurotransmitter. It is like a chemical messenger that communicates between the nerve cells and the brain to the body. And it plays a significant role in memory and in movement and in behavior. And if those that are familiar with Parkinson's disease, we understand that when we talk about the symptoms in which we'll talk about a little bit later, we'll understand why, why those symptoms happen because of the dopamine, um, the dop what, what the dopamine plays in our bodies. So there are five stages um, of Parkinson's disease, stage one being the very early stage, very mild, um, mild tremors. Oftentimes at this stage, patients do not know that they actually have the disease. They just kind of understand that, you know, when I move a certain way or at certain times or whatever randomly, I may have these tremors. As we move through the stages, um, stages five, four, and five are the ones that we really are going to kind of hone in on in this discussion, because stage four is when we start seeing debilitating symptoms, when we start seeing um, 
disability occurring, when we start seeing those really major symptoms that will impact um, life and impact assisted um, um, activities of daily living, a will um, impact mobility, will impact quality of care. And so I just want us to just kind of stay tuned to the conversation around stage four and stage five. Next slide. Parkinson's symptoms. Oh, I apologize for this slide because I'm just noticing that the letters are have been changed. So that is supposed to read co cognitive changes, bull box symptoms, and motor symptoms. But anyway, it's good old technology. So anyway, cognitive changes, what we often see in the cognitive changes really is dementia. And um, I want to add that there are two types of dementia that typically occurs during Parkinson's disease. Oftentimes they are under one umbrella, which is Lewy body. But just to be specific, there's there's two types of, of dementia, and that is Parkinson's dementia, where the patient may experience attention deficits, memory, um, memory decline, problems with um, problem solving, you know, just the simple things I forgot to put, I forgot that when I load up the dishwasher, it's supposed to have a, a pod in it or whatever, but I've done that so many times um, that now it becomes problematic, things like that. Um, those are the Parkinson's um, dementia. And then we have the Lewy body dementia. And with the Lewy body dementia, it's, it has the same symptoms as Parkinson's dementia, but the major characteristic of Lewy body dementia is, the, is hallucinations. And we know that hallucinations can either come from a visual perspective or an auditory perspective. And oftentimes we can see, we see both of those um, experienced in a patient with Parkinson's disease. The bull bar symptoms typically are when a patient has the swallowing difficulties. Dysphagia is a, can be a major issue with Parkinson's um, disease. So dysphagia is just a difficulty to, in swallowing. So this patient has swallowing issues, big or small. Oftentimes they go unnoticed in the beginning. The concern with swallowing issues or, or dysphagia is one, aspiration. And we know that aspiration can occur silently. So in the beginning, so initially aspiration can occur and people have no clue because, you know, it's just a little bit is going into the lungs, a little bit, not enough to cause me to cough, not enough, you know, for me, for it to cause any additional outwardly, outward symptoms. But we know over time, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit leads to a lot. And so by the time it gets to what I'm just referring to as a lot, then those patients oftentimes are experiencing aspiration pneumonia. But also with dysphagia or difficulty swallowing, those patients are also experiencing weight loss, weight loss, malnutrition. Um, so we, we're so page, so families are having to change diet. So they're going from a regular diet to a soft diet to a puree diet. And oftentimes, sometimes those patients have to make the decision of whether I want a feeding tube or not, because I have lost so much weight and I cannot consume the caloric intake that my body needs. So those are the bull bar symptoms. The other one is um, change in communication. And so that is a, that that that's a huge one. There is something that's called speech freeze, and in speech freeze, that means I know what I want to say, but I just can't get it out. And so a lot of our patients experience um, speech freeze. So we see that change of communication or that difficulty in being able to communicate verbally in the bull bar symptoms. And then oftentimes we are often, um, we often characterize Parkinson's disease with the motor symptoms. And that can be the tremors, the loss of balance, um, the shuffling, 
the shuffling gait, um, the inability to just to just get myself up. I don't have that strength to get myself up. And stage four and stage five that we mentioned on the previous slide, stage four is they, at this point, stage four, they probably are needing some assistance with just getting up and down. By stage five, most times these patients are either primarily chair ridden or they, they are already bed ridden because of the symptoms that have occurred. Next slide. Pallium. So when we talk about um, when we talk about palliative care and hospice, and we're going to get into that a little bit, I just wanted to just kind of share where the word comes from. So actually, palliative care has been around for a significant amount of time. So this is not anything new. Um, I think now the buzz, we're just getting the buzz. And now there's talk around it. Now there's money around it as far as insurance companies. And so, you know, when, when there's money around it, then the buzz comes with, with that. But the role of palliative care has been there for a substantial amount of about a years. But the word palliative comes from the word pallium. And it was a Middle Eastern um, blessing that just means to cloak or to wrap. So we kind of wrap everything around. The, it's, it's thought about as wrapping our symptoms, the symptoms that someone may be experiencing. We kind of wrap those, uh, you know, wrap them enough to give them the support, what they need through this journey. So I just wanted to share where, where the word palliative comes from, comes from the word pallium. Next slide. So here we are. So this is this is a huge question that is always brought forth. What is the difference between palliative care and hospice? And I will say that if you have ever asked that question, it is okay because we are answering that question even when it comes to our medical providers. So we are still having to define the difference between palliative care and hospice even in the medical community. Um, so it is, you know, although it's been around a long time and although there's still lots of buzz around it, there's still a lot of um, myths and misconceptions when it comes to palliative care and hospice. So those are, I just want to start off by saying that those are two separate, separate entities. They share some qualities but they are two separate. So they are not palliative care is not hospice. Hospice can share palliative care, but palliative care is not hospice. So every patient that is on palliative care may or may not go to hospice. And every hospice patient may not have, may not have ever seen palliative care. So I wanna start with palliative care first. So palliative care's purpose is really to alleviate symptoms. Palliative care is there to one, alleviate symptoms, and two, to educate that patient and family um, around this journey that they may be experiencing, the journey that they are on at that stage in their lives. And then three is to have those conversations, to start those conversations that we don't want to start. But in palliative care, oftentimes we find that Patients and family have never had those conversations. They have never had the goals of care conversation. They've never had the conversation around do not resuscitate. They've never, they just never have, have looked at it that, that way. No one has ever brought it forth to them. And so in palliative care, we start to have those conversations. I use the word start because we find that when that patient transitions into hospice, that conversation is still ongoing. So oftentimes we have patients that are in hospice that's been in palliative care and they are still a full cold. And so, and that's okay, that's okay. I'm just sharing that the conversation is an ongoing conversation. Now, some homes, you, you know, 
in my experience, some homes we get there and patients and families are ready. They get it. They ready. I, you know, I, I've just been waiting for someone to facilitate the conversation. We didn't know how to have that conversation. And so they are ready to make that, that decision. But then you also allow people to understand, respect the journey that people are on and people do are may not be ready to make that conversation. So that's why I use the term that is ongoing. And we'll talk about that a little further as well. But that is our purpose of, um, of palliative care who can join palliative care. The difference between palliative care and hospice is that in palliative care, those are people that are living with serious illness. Those are our cancer folks that, um, that are still working. Those are our stage, if we're using um, Parkinson's disease, this, is, this can be our stage three or our stage four. Um, Parkinson's disease patient, patient is still functioning, patient is still, you know, on some level, when I say functioning, they're functioning on some level, there may be symptoms there that they need help with. So this is, these are the patients that qualify for palliative care. Any prognosis at this time, we talk about the goals of care. Palliative care takes place anywhere the patient exists, anywhere the patient calls home. Palliative care oftentimes is only coming with a provider. Now, I will say this for Transitions Life Care just because we know that different palliative care across, even across our region and definitely across the, um, across the country, palliative care looks very different, different according to which palliative care you, 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 you go to. So let me just speak to Transitions Life Care palliative care. So when a patient is on our palliative care service, they will receive a nurse practitioner and a social worker. Um, I understand in certain parts of the country that may come with um, transportation services, that may come with meals, particularly, and I, and I um, my brain is referencing truly the North, um, I think in the New York, New Jersey area, they come with a, a little, there's, there's a little more services that are um, involved. But for us, and in my experience, even in the triangle area, um, those of us that are serving palliative care patients, they're typically just coming with a, a provider for us as a nurse practitioner and a social worker. Um, and so we are having those conversations mainly and alleviating um, those symptoms and improving quality of life at the end of, at the, end of the day. So now let's talk a little bit about hospice. Hospice is not a place, and I want to just stress that, that it is not a place that people go. Hospice is a medical model. Hospice is made up of a team of doctors, NPs, social workers, grief counselors, CNAs, the whole nine yard that is coming to wherever that patient calls home again. I use the term serious in a palliative care patient and a hospice patient is terminal. So that serious condition has now either it was terminal and we just used it serious or it has transitioned into terminal. And so that there is an eligibility process that goes with a hospice patient, whereas there's really not one for palliative care. But with hospice, Medicare kind of gives the guidelines on what that should look like. So we go through that process of, you know, vetting out who. And I, I, I wanted to add right here is if you have a patient um, or a family member or a loved one and you thinking that that patient may need hospice, they probably need hospice. So don't wait. Don't wait and allow the hospice facility or organization to truly make that call. So don't be afraid. It's never too early because what we find in hospice is that people come on sometimes a little too late. And what I mean by that is that the hospice provides so many services, so much support, not only for the patient, but also for the family that when that patient comes on, 
what we consider, you know, too late. Um, I'm just using that very, very loosely is that um, the patients and families don't get an opportunity to experience everything that hospice has to offer. Um, next slide. So this just kind of shows us when we talk about that cloak, when we talk about pallium and how all of it encircles into one, on the outside in the blue area, the, the, the light blue area, I just want to emphasize that, and we talked a little bit about this, this kind of shows it in a more pictorial form of the cloak, is um, that palliative approach to the life-limiting illness. The, the goal here is quality of life. There's enough research to support that when a patient is placed on palliative care and or hospice, that it truly improves their quality of life. Why? Because we're getting on symptoms very early in the game. Pain is one of those symptoms um, that we oftentimes see that we know, again, that research has supported that it decreases quality of life. When people are in pain, then they are not able to function at a level. They are not able to enjoy things that they that that used to bring them joy, you know, families or outings or, or whatever. They tend to be um, less engaged um, just within the home. They tend to spend most of their time in the home. Um, and so all of that affects the quality of life. But if we are able to come in a little early and help to manage those symptoms, then the goal is to improve that quality of life. So in this, in this approach right here, you, you're fine that when you see the palliative um, care in the light blue, it still encircles the end of life care, which, which is actually hospice. So this is when a patient is weeks to months um, is receiving palliative or medical treatment, still can be, you know, re receiving some type of treatment, but it's an ongoing support, it's that caregiver relief. And then we move into the last day, so we don't stop doing what we're doing. So we don't stop providing palliative care. We don't stop, we, we don't stop providing that end of life care, even when it comes to the last days and hours. We are really at that point focusing on keeping that patient as comfortable as possible and making that transition as easy, um, as easy as possible, not only from a physical standpoint, but also from a psychological, a spiritual, and an emotional standpoint for the patient and the family, because the family is going through as well. So that's the, one of the beauty of, of, of hospice care is that we understand that the patient is on, the, the patient's families and loved ones are on this journey as well, and they need that support. And I will add that even after the death of a loved one, is that hospice provides 13 months afterwards um, support for those loved ones. And so those loved ones can still receive counseling, grief counseling, 13 months after the death of a loved one. And I will say this, it doesn't have to end at 13 months. So I know for, for us, our grief counselors are very, um, that they are able to recognize um, that extended need if need be. Um, next slide. So here we go, goals of care. And I put under this slide is um, disease progression and hospice eligibility. But what is goals of care? We know that in advance, Parkinson disease, particularly if we go back to the stages, stage four and stage, stage five, that they can present with challenging clinical issues that oftentimes will lead to hospitalizations. And in those hospitalizations, patients are susceptible to complication, mainly being sepsis, you know, which arise from a, against the backdrop of progressive design, I mean, decline in the overall faction. So in advance, um, Parkinson disease, it's very difficult to anticipate life expectancy, but in the overall deterioration is an important indicator of progression. 
Now, I lead with that because we understand, we have to understand that piece of it to understand the purpose and the reasoning behind having the goals of care conversation. Um, when I give talks about hospice in, 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 in particular, I always say, you know, for when, when we're doing the work and when we're having those conversations, we think about the end. So we understand the trajectory of the disease, any disease. And so we, we understand what the end looks like and we kind of work our way backwards. And so that's kind of, you know, how you have to think about when you're having these goals of care conversations is that we understand the end. Now we are here. How are we going to, wh what are we talking about? When we're talking about goals of care, we're talking about that interim between here and what it looks like. But oftentimes we find, you know, there's many barriers to goals of care. One is fear. And, and, it, and we definitely recognize that and we understand that. Um, so oftentimes people will not or are very reluctant in having these conversations when the, when the underlying issue is fear. We, we, we get that. And so we have to work through, tell me what, you know, tell me what part are you afraid of? And that comes with lots of work, lots of therapy, lots of this discussion. So this is not a one time, it's not a one time discussion. This, these, these are multiple um, conversations to get patients and families to understand. The, we still got to get them to understand. It's still important to get them to understand the, the purpose of having um, the goals of care conversations. But I want us to also understand that Parkinson's disease is not a terminal disease, but because of the symptoms that occurs in that trajectory, it leads us to the um, to the terminal phase that will make a patient eligible, a Parkinson's disease patient eligible for hospice and or um, palliative care. So the need for um, goals of care discussion stems from the unpredictable disease trajectory and understanding that most people die in the hospital rather than at home. Well, studies show that patients would prefer to die at home rather than in the hospital because we already determined that with multiple hospital admissions the increased risk of sepsis is there it's a you know that's that's we're, we're, we're at a significant risk so do then the question is now do i keep going back to the hospital and with a possible possibility of getting septic or getting some type of infection and all that or is there a possibility that I can stay at home? So those are our goals of care conversations that need to happen. How do we have these goals of care conversation? I will start off by saying, if you are, are, are wanting to have those conversations in the home, make time for it. I don't think that dinner time is an appropriate time. I don't think just, you know, everyone sitting around watching TV and we just decide to have a conversation. I do think we need to, we should set time to have that conversation. Um, secondly, before we have that conversation, whatever time that is set, I think that it's in the, there's individual work that has to be done because we all are coming in with our own biases. We all are coming in with our own experiences. And so we have to be very cognizant that we don't put, I don't put my experience on my loved one. So if my loved one says something that doesn't quite align with what I'm thinking of what I should, I have to remember that it's not me, it's not my life, it's not my journey, and it's not my decision to make, particularly if that patient is alert and oriented and is able to make that decision for themselves. And I say that because I have to add that because I see that a lot. 
many, 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 many times. And, and I know that it is done unintentionally, but we have to be very mindful of to not do that. And sometimes I do want to say, no, she does. She doesn't want that. Well, yes, she does. Yes, she does. And so we have to respect the loved one's de decision. Um, we have to allow space for those emotions. And we have to be ready for whatever emotion that may come. It could be anger. It can be sadness. It can be guilt, disappointment, fear. So as as we, we have to allow space for that because it is okay. This is not a, a conversation that most of us want to have. This is a conversation that is coupled with me understanding where I am in this journey. Me understanding that, oh, oh this is about my mortality. Oh, oh, I'm having a conversation about making that final transition. So what does that look like for me? So we have to allow that space for those emotions that may that may arise. And nine times out of 10, an emotion will arise and it is okay. And we it, it is okay to do that. We have to allow time for people to make a decision, make a, a you know, to make an informed decision. I know I used to do palliative care. I do hospice um, primarily now, but in my palliative care days, when I would precept new um, nurse practitioners coming through, it was like, oh, I have to, you know, I have to tell them about, you know, what they want, what's their goals of care. And I would always say, well, Rome wasn't built in a day. So, I mean, allow people time to give them the information, whether it takes a day, whether it takes a week, whether it takes a month, allow people time to just process, ask those questions so they can make an informed decisions for, for themselves. Provide options. That's one of our biggies that, that we find as well is when you're having those goals of care conversations, it's not, and I'll use the example of, um, we currently have a partnership um, with a kidney, with ne nephrology. And we find that with their palliative care patients, it's very similar um, with the Parkinson's because it's a certain, they are, they are in stages as well. And so it's a certain stage that we come in and, and start to have those conversations. But when I started doing the work with the kidney people, um, what I found with them was it's either I stopped dialysis and make the transition or I do dialysis and live out my life and it was it, it's it was truly that black and white for them there was no middle ground there was that you know there was no other options and I think for a lot of people that's how they feel is that there's no other option there's no in between there are there, there 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 are in betweens, and so we have to let people know that there are some in betweens. So if you stop this, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this, and we can do this before the transition, or to make that transition even you know an an an, a, an easier transition if you did not do that. And so we have to know those options, but also provide those options. And then at the end of the day, you can always bring experts in. We are ready and we are ready to um, have those conversations with families and with the patients um, about goals of care and how to facilitate those goals of care. And we can actually help to facilitate those goals of care as well. So I just wanted to just kind of give highlight the importance of goals of care, but also highlight how do we have that conversation? Because one of the barriers that, that research has noted is that the reason people don't have goals of care because they don't know how to have the goals of care. So if I don't know how to do it, then I just don't do it. And so that is one of the barriers. So I just wanted to bring that to the forefront um, during this presentation. When we talk about disease um, progression, 
and we are having um, those conversations, we need to note, particularly when it comes to Parkinson's disease, what, when we talk about disease progression, what disease progression in particularly do we need to be having as it relates to our goals of care? One of the, we, we think about practical problems that may arise. So in, pal, in Parkinson's disease, we find that having um, the difficulty and taking adequate nourishment. So then the conversation needs to be, does that patient want an NG tube? Does that patient want a peg tube? Does that patient want to just say, I don't want anything? And let me just stop here for a minute. That is always a good response, if that is the response from an informed place of the patient. N not to do anything is just as respected as do something. So I just wanted to add that because we do have patients that say, I don't, you, I don't want anything to happen, just allow it to happen. And then we have loved ones that come behind and says, no, you, you gotta do something. And I just wanted to just pause here for a second, just to say, it is okay. Nothing, do nothing is an answer, um, a respected answer as well as do something. Um, so when it comes to uh, adequate nutrition, those are the conversations that kind of we need to have early on. And let me just add, particularly when it comes to Parkinson's disease, these conversations need to have need to be had before stage five. I will say conversations need to, if all possible, it needs to be initiated very early in the disease because then people have time to think and then people have time to process. And as we journey through that, those stages, it changes. And so then, I mean, your goals are fluid. They are not, I made them this year, they're the same three years later. They may or may not be. And so, but it gives that patient an opportunity to make a decision for, for themselves and a decision as they, they are going through their own journey. The other thing when it relates to Parkinson's disease and disease eligibility is looking at respiratory failure. So then the goals of care conversation is, do we want mechanical ventilation? So that's a tracheostomy, think, think, things like that. Yes or no? For how long? How short? This, this conversation can go as long, you know, as, as big as we want it to go, or it can go as simple as the patient would like for it, for it to go. But, it, but we need to have those conversations. And the other one is cardio um, respiratory arrest. So that's, do we want to initiate CPR? Um, at end of life, and we'll talk about um, that in just a second. Hospice eligibility. So when do we bring palliative care and or hospice on? We primarily look at symptoms. We look at symptoms and we look at functionality. And in hospice, we use something that's called a PPS, which is the palliative performance scale. And all of us should be at 100%. Um, now, but we know that that's, that scale goes by 10. So it's 100%, 90%, 80%, 70 goes down as our function goes down. And so when a patient gets to about 40, somewhere between 40 and 50%, we look at everything. So we look at, you know, we look at the whole picture. But when the patient gets about 40%, then the consideration of palliative care or hospice that's, that's when, when we start to have those conversations. That's when it should at least be considered um, is when those conversations start to happen. Because at that point, we start to see the functionality of that patient change. And as it relates to Parkinson's disease, we see that those symptoms, motor symptoms have really start to advance. So those patients need significant amount of assistance with activities of daily living. They are, they need a significant amount of um, assistance with walking. We know that those motor symptoms 
lead to an increased risk of falls. Falls is a biggie. We know that falls increase mortality rate. So if those patients are falling, just falling, you know, um, that's, that's hospice eligibility within itself. When we talk about the symptoms of dysphagia and swallowing difficulties, and we have that unintentional weight loss and that malnutrition, if they've lost 10%, um, over a certain amount of time, it's about 60 to 90 days, according to Medicare, that's hospice eligibility right now. We also consider the caregivers. So the caregivers are always in the back of our heads. Um, what does caregiver, there is something that is called caregiver burden. And so we recognize that. So what can we do to help eliminate or help to alleviate um, some of that caregiver burden. Oftentimes we find that patients have one caregiver. There's one. And they are literally working around the clock. And so the quality of life of both individuals then is, you know, is significantly impacted. And so what we have found is that something happens to the caregiver. So then we have a patient there and that's, you know, we know that that, that, that happens, but the goal is when we get folks on early enough, hopefully we can talk through and get some resources out there and running and available to patients and families to mitigate some of those issues that, that we know, um, May, may arrive. So this is when we start to put folks on to um, on to, to hospice or or palliative care. But to hospice, there's something that's called a rapid disease progression, particularly in um, in Parkinson's disease, and that is when that patient is bedridden. So now you look at your at your stage five. So that patient is bedridden. They have an unintelligible speech. They're typically on a parade diet, and they need significant amount of assistance, or they may just be dependent at that point of activities of, day, of daily living. When a patient gets to there, I would not recommend palliative care. That patient is now hospice eligible um, at that point. Uh, next slide. So surrogate decision making. Um, I put this in here because I want to talk about advanced um, advanced care planning. And um, when we look at advanced directives on advanced care planning, advanced care planning increases the knowledge of the preference of the patient. It increases the comfort decision making. It increases satisfaction, but it reduces caregiver burden. And um, as I stated before, one of the major or the major barriers to advanced care planning is fear and lack of knowledge. But when we talk about the goals of care and the advanced care planning, we got to decide who's going to do the work, who is making the decision. Because when that patient is no longer able to make an informed decision for themselves, then who can make that decision? And so I put this pyramid here because this is the state of North Carolina's decision making order. Um, it is the state of North Carolina. Every state is different. So we have to note that. So we can go to South Carolina, we can go to Georgia, all of our, you know, North Virginia, all of our, you know, even um, border states or other states across the um, across the nation, you will probably find this may be different. So I just want to note that this is for the state of North Carolina. So at the top of the pyramid, of course, the patient. And then um, oftentimes we, you know, there if if the patient has um, designated a healthcare power of attorney, and again, this is a conversation that we have in th during um, if a patient is on palliative care, who is your healthcare power of attorney? Who who is that person or persons? Um, that's a big one, because when people have lots of family and lots of children, that can be a very difficult conversation for folks to make. 
but we got to have the conversation. You know, you, you, I mean, who do you trust that will make a decision that you would want that would follow what your your wishes or your wants are. But though that can be a very difficult conversation for a lot of people, and then for some people it's not. They are very clear um, of who they want as their healthcare power attorney. But after the healthcare power attorney, oftentimes with the legal guardian, and those are you know people that's within the state, or you know the state has has guardianship, or maybe a person has guardianship over an individual. But after that then it's a spouse. And then after a spouse, it is either parents and or children. Now I want to add, with this is the majority that are available. So that is the caveat here. So if there are six kids all together and four are in Raleigh and we cannot get in contact with the other two, they are not available and we need to make a decision, it will be the majority of the four, not the majority of the six. So the other two, I mean, at that point it becomes, that's a family issue. It's not a medical issue at that point. So I just want to note because we find that a lot, um, parents, of course, you know, they age in a different state in which, you know, our definitely in the state of North Carolina in my, you know, in my experience and children are, you know, just all over the United States. They are not here. We're trying to get kids to come in. We're trying to talk to them, to them on the phone. And at that point, it's just the majority that's available. Now, availability can also mean I have talked to you over the phone. I mean, we can do a Zoom call, you know, that can be available. But you have, you don't necessarily have to be seen in person. You just have to be available. But now, if you're not available, then the decision will go forth with whomever is available. And then you see as it goes down, the siblings, if there's no spouse, if there's no children, then there's still siblings and then it's people that have an established relationship. And then after that point, then that medical provider um, or physician will make the decision at that point. Next slide. And I think this is actually, this is actually my final slide. So when we talk about advanced directives, these are three forms that you will typically see. The top left is the yellow form. It's often called the golden rod. Um, it is the form that has the stop sign. If you go in folks' houses, this is the form that's on the refrigerator. Um, and we tell people, please put it on the refrigerator. And that's only because when EMS um, comes into the home, that's just the place that they will just, if they need to look quickly, they will look um, to see if that patient is a DNR. But this is a form that uh, was created first. And this is your do not resuscitate form. This is your DNR. So I want to pause here for a second because I think just to say that DNR does not mean a patient has a heart attack and they are still breathing. So a DNR does not take place unless there is not, you know, there's no sign of life. So we do not have a pulse and we do not, have, we, we are not breathing. So do you want CPR at this point? So I say that because I get, I get the question all the time, but what if I just fall out and have a heart attack? Well, honey, we're going to take you to the nearest hospital available. But this is your, your DNR. I will say that at the top, it has an effective date, but it also has an expiration date. And so it has to be what we typically check is that box under there that says that there is no expiration. So that means it is active, it is legal um, forever. You know, it, it, it is a legal document. The five wishes is a patient driven approach document it's actually um it's actually not one page it kind of shows one page but it's actually like a little booklet it's only well when i say booklet it's only about maybe five or six pages in it but it kind of walks the patient through questions um to make those decisions for themselves this is really patient driven it is an easy read for patients and families um 
they can do it at their leisure, a page a day, a page every two days, or whatever. We leave this in the home. It is not legal. I mean, it is not um, valid. This five wishes actually has to be notarized. Um, the DNR does not have to be notarized. It just has to be signed by a provider. Um, but the five wishes actually have to be notarized. When I talk about barriers, that is one of our barriers as well. And we, and, and, and we know that is that this is very easy to do. This is very um, simple. Patients love it because it kind of just lets me, you know, get into my own space and think about some things. And I can do that without somebody asking all of these questions. I can just kind of think about that. But then the barrier is that it has to be notarized in order for it to hold up in a court of, in a court of law. So if you can't get the patient out, you know, to get it notarized, you know, traveling notar notary, we know they do exist, but we also note that in some areas they may or may not be available. But anyway, with that's the, those are just some barriers that may come up. And then lastly, at the bottom right, your pink form is what we call the most form. The most form and the golden rod, the yellow form, kind of go hand in hand. We use those together. The most form goes into just a little more detail. The most form is that form that says, I want an IV. It only it only talks about IV antibiotic therapy and nutrition. So I want it, and the three choices are very simple. It is either do all of it, do a little bit of it for a limited time, or don't do anything at all. So those are the three boxes that the patient gets to choose. Um, but it is again, this is a working document. Um, on the back of it is an opportunity to sign and date. And it has to be signed and dated on a yearly basis. So it is it is reviewed annually. And this is the pink form. So these are our three options when we're talking about advanced directives. These are our three particular our three documents um, that is used um, and can be used when you're having those conversations about advanced directives. And I think that's it. Next slide. That's it. That's all I have. Do we have any questions or comments? I know that was a lot of information. Now, Maggie, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't hear you if you're. I was muted. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Dwan. Thank you for sharing your perspective on um, hospice and a little bit of what um, end of life may look like um, and, uh, and, and for being with us today. If anyone has particular questions, uh, we invite you to share them in the chat if you are able to um, uh, access that chat feature. I have a couple um, that I'll just uh, start off with if, if anyone um, wants to take your time uh, adding your questions to the chat. Uh, but one of the things that came up um, for me when I was listening was, um, what is a misconception that you most often hear about hospice from, from families that, that you could share with these families? Here? Sure, sure. Um, I'm not going to share just one oh my because there's, <laughs> but I will share my top ones. And one is that hospice, the patient comes to die. Um, that's the place that the patient comes to die. So when you hear hospice, and again, I will add that that's also a barrier is that the misconception is that hospices, once they come on hospice, that's it. And so that's why, you know, it's important for us to know that hospice is a medical model. So it's just like, you know, if, if something happens to the heart, we go to the cardiologist. We don't go to the orthopedic. We go to the cardiologist. If you're at the cardiologist and you fall, the cardiologist can't do, he's going to refer you to orthopedic. And so if you think about it in those terms, that when we get to that point, if a patient gets to that point where that particular provider is unable to provide a service, 
then if that service is now happens to be hospice, it just, you just going along from the cardiologist to the, you know, and in these, you know, and in this case, it's like the neurologist or in terminal mm -hmm. illness from the oncologist to the, to the hospice providers. Um, so that is one misconception um, that we, you know, and, and we definitely understand and it needs to be more education around uh, what hospice is and does. And then the second one is around morphine. And so, um, you know, when that patient comes on to hospice, patients and families can be very hesitant in using morphine because they see morphine as an opiate and an opiate is a street, is a street drug. Um, it hastens, I mean, it, you know, it just, it, it, that's, the, that's the one drug that's going to expedite the death process. Um, and so I will say that, you know, in educating folks around morphine is morphine is probably the best drug we have um, because morphine not only is used for pain, but it's also used for shortness of breath. It hits respiratory fibers first before it hits brain fibers that's going to control pain. And then it works as an um, anxiety drug. So those folks that are experiencing, and particularly as we talk about Parkinson's disease, those people that are experiencing the Lewy body, dementia, um, and most you know, are, are experiencing that on some level, benefit from the use of morphine. Um, so anyway, those would be my top two. It's just the word hospice and, um, and then the use of morphine. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And and I will just add, you know, in the world of, of Parkinson's disease, um, we often talk about how all encompassing Parkinson's is, you know, it's not just a motor disorder. There are, are um, so many non motor non motor symptoms that come along with it as well. And, um, and it doesn't look the same for every single person. And so I, and in death is the same, the same way. It's not going to look the same for every That's single person. Right? Yeah. And um, I, and I'm glad you mentioned that. And just, just to go back to your original question is I probably was, will add that's probably number three. You just, uh, you know, is, is that when people have experienced a death, that doesn't mean that it's going to look like the same way that, that it was experienced in that particular individual. Um, the journey is different. Every, just like we are unique individuals, we don't look like anyone else. Um, that process is the exact same, same, same way. And people are so, can, can be kind of shocked at how quickly it happened. They were not expecting that. Well, that's just, I, I kind of shared the same thing as having a baby. You know, when that baby come, we won't expect that. You know, not at that time, not, not right then. So it's the same, the similar. Um, experience. Thank you. Thank you for adding that. We've got a couple questions that are coming in. Um, this person asks, I live out in rural North Carolina. Is home hospice accessible to me? Very good question. We just did um, the, I just spoke last week with the um, rural, I think it was the rural nurses association. Um, for the state of North Carolina, and we talked about the challenges and the barriers of hospice and palliative care in rural settings. And so there are many. So I will say that there are many, many um, barriers um, for our rural communities. Um, there are hospices available, but we know that the barriers come from the environmental challenges, you know, being behind, I'm from, I'm from a rural town, I'm from Sampson County. So I understand being behind a tractor on a two lane highway. Um, so, you know, that's a barrier. We, we understand that um, communication as far as um, 
telemedicine, you know, telemedicine is, is, is good, but it's only good if people have what you need to make it work. And we know that in rural communities, the bronze with, you know, and all that fiber oftentimes is not available. So to answer that question short, you know, short term is that, yes, there's hospices available, but there are barriers. It may not look the same as it would be in, in urban or sub, um, suburban areas. And um, I will just say that there is hospice available in Orange County, like um, North Carolina, that, that is, is available there, even if you're in the rural parts of Orange. Um, uh, another question um, is, um, I have my end of life papers with my primary care and in my will, where else should I have them? Okay, no, that's a good question. So is there, you can always put it with someone that you trust. I don't know if there's also a healthcare power attorney. Um, that may be a good place to have them as well. And then the other place to have them is a place in, just within the home. So I guess wherever you're keeping just th th this is, and I will share that this was the experience that we had when I say we, my sister and I had is my parents had everything, you know, you know, we knew that they had a will and all that, but the problem was we didn't know the code. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yes, if it's going to be locked up, in the home, please give someone um, access or know how to access uh, wherever you're, you're putting them. But I would, the only other person that I would really think about is if you have designated a healthcare power of attorney, but great job, whoever that is, applaud yourself for getting that done. Good job. Yeah, yeah I completely agree. I, I totally um, second having them somewhere accessible and um, whoever is, uh, designated or whoever um, is uh, even close to the person who's designated, who's close to you, they should have a copy so that everybody um, who uh, who might be involved in the decision making process uh, right. knows what you want. That's right. Yeah. yeah, making sure everybody has a copy. That's that's um, something that you don't think of often, but it is a good thing to do. Um, now, I, uh, I'm happy to take this one if, if you don't feel comfortable, but this question is, who do I talk with about my, uh, who do I talk with about what my long term care insurance will cover now that I have Parkinson's? Oh, you can cover that one, Mac. You want me to cover that? Yes. Yeah. So, long term care insurance. Um, when it comes to long-term care insurance, I encourage people to always be in um, in conversation with their um, their lawyer. Uh, if if they have a lawyer, if you don't have a lawyer, with your financial um, counselor uh, who can really uh, work with you about um, everything your long-term care insurance will cover and will not cover, so that you know how long it's how what it's going to cover and how long it will sustain you that way you can prepare for the future about um, what coverage might be needed down the road in the future um, so I, I always turn to the the, the legal and the financial um, people with expertise in, in the, that realm to talk about long-term care insurance um, or specifically talk to your long-term care insurance provider. Um, they're going to be the ones who are going to be able to tell you uh, uh, how much it covers. And you should be able to find that information. Um, uh, there should be a phone number on in any of that information that you have to call and talk with the long-term care insurance provider. Um, next question. I know Parkinson's disease deaths will vary broadly, but can you say more about what a typical death process might be? A social worker told me that their experience was that Parkinson's deaths frequently happen quickly at the end. Is that your experience? Hmm. Um, that has not been my experience. Um, I, I don't I don't know 
I, I don't know what quickly is. And the only reason I say that is because we know that it is a journey. So we know that, you know, uh, the patient has to go through those stages. And so, you, you know, you know, a person can be in stage four for an amount of time, and then they can be in stage five for an amount of time, you know, an, an amount of time. So um, I guess let me just speak to what it looks like. I guess that that question and, and whoever asked that question can definitely clarify me if I'm going in the wrong direction, but maybe they are asking for the at the last days. I, I, I guess that's that's what what where, where that question is. So we've gone through stage four, we've gone through, we're transitioning um, into stage five. So now this patient is bedridden and um, and again, it's difficult for me to answer that as far as the timing, because again, we are all unique and that depth journey is just as unique as we are. And we have had, we know that there are certain things to look for as far as timing, one being change in aspiration, I mean, change in respiration. So a patient becomes a little more apneic where they are. You know, that breath slows down, the respiration slows down, um, but but that just occurs with anyone. So this, this is not specific to Parkinson's because in my experience, and I've been doing the work for about 12 years now, when we get to those last days and hours, you can't tell one disease from another one. I mean, there's no, all of it kind of looks the same at the end. And so there are certain symptoms that indicate truly you know now we're looking at weeks potentially days we know that mottling which is the change of skin color um that you oftentimes see in the perimeter in, in the um in the extremities if you see it in the lower extremity probably halfway the calf you're looking at about 12 hours i'll be honest i probably have only seen that one time so that's not something that everyone experiences. So that's why I just want to, you know, just kind of note that um, it, it is hard to, to say what's quick and what's not, because truly everybody's journey, we just know that when that patient is making that transition and, and, and to those, you know, and, and, and are experiencing those symptoms that indicate that they really are in those last days and hours, that we are there to support that person. We are there to alleviate those symptoms. We are there to alleviate those fears as much as possible, regardless of the length of time. Um, so I hope I was able to answer that question. Um, if, if there is any clarification please, that you would like, please put it in the chat and we can do our best to clarify that. I think that, um, that uh, I don't know if I was the social worker, um, so I'll just say that. Um, but uh, I think that you're exactly right. That um, word quickly is very relative, especially in the Parkinson's disease journey, because we're talking about decades. People live right. Parkinson's disease for decades. Um, so what does quickly mean? Does quickly mean you know within right. a matter of days, um, months, um, hours? Right. Uh, it, it is it is again unique, which is um, unique to that individual and that person's ex experience um, with the disease progression as well, which is the I think one of the hardest uh, hardest parts about having these conversations is uh, we want to have concrete information to know, um, but a, a lot of it is. Uh, is individualized and um, not something that we can put a number on. That's right. Yeah. Um, uh, another question, um, and you've, you've talked a, a little bit about this, but I'm wondering if um, there is a particular, Parkinson's or not, but a particular um, experience that you could share um, with the group about what a good death has looked like? like maybe from the family perspective or the patient perspective, do you have a story to share? Absolutely, plenty of those, but I'll just 
say that if 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 family is present and if family have been educated and supported that's a good death quote unquote a good death on its own because then when families are supported then they can help to send that energy that positive energy to the patient that is making that transition because we find that patients that we find oftentimes when there's a lot of chaos within the family, um, a lot of tension, a lot of negativity, um, a lot of misunderstanding. We see that in the patient. And regardless of how much medications that we give, it truly affects that patient's ability to transition peacefully because we understand that the body is just not a physical being that the body is an emotional and a psychological um being as well we are that's it's all one it's not there we know we're not um in silos we are it's, it's all one system so when one is affected you definitely see it in the other one so i would say i just wanted to preface that you know that is one of the reasons to have these type of conversations and discussions so everybody can kind of be on that one page when that patient begins to make that that transitions but in my experience a good death has always been um one where patients are knowing what this looks like They've been educated. They know when to say, you know, when there's an ability to, to if they are still able to speak, they, they, they say, this is what I want. This is what I don't want. One, when that time comes, you make sure you do. I say, I, I got you. I got you. I will be there. Um, and then everybody knows and understands. From a physical standpoint, you always want that patient to be as comfortable as possible. We know that in some cases that involves treatment, that involves medications, that will involve, this is where morphine comes into play. So we want people to be comfortable. We don't want them to be agitated. That's not a good death. So agitation and anxiety is never a good, that's never outside of pain. Forget about pain because everybody doesn't experience pain. But agitation and anxiety is real. And so when that patient is experiencing that, that's not a good death. But you have to use medication in order to help with that. There is something that is called terminal agitation. We don't know why there's an, uh, it's an unknown etiology. So we know that about 20% of the population goes into terminal agitation for whatever reason. So in terminal agitation, these patients are just agitated out of the, I mean, and they're just doing stuff. And I will say from a personal standpoint, my father experienced um, terminal agitation. He was a very calm, just cool, cool dude. And um, for whatever reason, he experienced a terminal agitation. He was crawling on the floor. He was just doing stuff. I mean, just, it just, it was, it was not good to experience and not good to see. And so I was all for give him any kind of medication because that's not him. And he would not want that to be his, his story. And mm -hmm. so, um, so we got to understand that, you know, we got to understand that go, go, going in. But when patients understand that and they are comfortable from a physical standpoint, from an emotional or psychological standpoint, and they are at peace, that's a good death. Yeah. That's a good death. Oh, thank, thank you for sharing, um, especially your personal experience and how that personal and professional can overlap sometimes. And um, and really just uh, take you, it can take you by surprise. And yeah, uh, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, uh, one other, I, I have two more, um, and unless any other ones come through. Um, but you you mentioned um, during the conversation during your presentation about you know people shouldn't be starting these end of life conversations maybe at the dinner table or when people are watching TV. But do you have any or do you have any examples of successful ways that people have started the these conversations? Yes, yes, yes. So there are people that kind of just say this is what we're gonna talk. This is what we're gonna talk about. So there's the and and that has been initiated by the patient. I yeah. mean, we've had plenty of patients that said this is. I need to talk about this. Like this, mm -hmm. this is. We we gonna have this conversation and have pulled spouse, children, whomever they think need to be in on that conversation. We've had children to initiate that conversation. We've had siblings to initiate um, that conversation. You know, it just depends on, the, on the, the, the relationship. So anyone can actually initiate the conversation. Um, I would just say that, you know, the reason that I say not with at the dinner table or things like that is just because that's not why I came to eat. You know, that's not why in my brain, like that's not why yeah. I came to eat at the dinner table. So you kind of need to be prepared that this is a conversation that, you know, that we, we want to have. Um, so, you know, my, my example is that I have so many is that people, you know, kind of initiate their own. When we, if people have not had those conversations, and they are referred to palliative care. That's, I mean, we're walking in the door at some point saying, we are about to initiate this conversation. And it always starts with what, tell me what your thoughts are. Because mm -hmm. I will say this, is that most people that are living with a serious and or terminal illness has had a thought of what this is going to look like whether it's a fearful thought, I don't care what kind of thought it is because I'm respectful to whatever thought we can work through all of that. Um, but they ha they've had a thought. It just have not gone from the thought to, to a conversation. So I always start with, is there anything you have thought about? And so however, wherever that is, initiates a conversation because then you know when you do the work it's really asking questions because then you ask another question and then you ask another question well then have you thought about this and you know and so the question after question after question stimulates a conversation and so anyway so that's why i would say you know if people have not initiated the conversation that's kind of how the conversation starts with just tell me what you have thought about and then yeah. from there expand the conversation that's helpful. Thank you. We had an additional question come in um, okay. while you were talking. Is the hearing the last thing to go in a person who is dying? That is that is true. So research actually supports that. So we did that of the census. I guess, you know, for those that, that do not know of the five senses, we know there's other senses, but of the five senses, um, hearing tends to be the last one. So even at that unconscious state, um, people can still hear. Um, and so that's why it is important that when people are making that transition, that you keep everything about the same. They still want to hear grandchildren running around. They still want to hear their loved ones talking in a normal environment. Um, if they've always grown up, I mean, if they've always had, I'm just saying, you know, like kids running around, or, you know, whatever, grandkids coming through the door and all of that. If that was a normal environment, that patient still wants their normal environment. And we often kind of step in and say, shh. And, you know, I, I walk into homes and it's just real quiet. And I'm saying, now I know she didn't live in all y'all in here. Now I know she didn't live in this house and it was this quiet. And so it's like, you don't have to have music blasting, but they still want to hear their loved ones talk. Um, and familiarity is still there. So I know that was a long response to, 
is hearing the last um the last sense it is it is I think that that's very reassuring um, because I think you're totally right that you get really quiet, um, but it's nice mm -hmm. to to really yeah. have that that conversation yeah. to keep going. Um, I, and I just I also want to add, um, you know, I think most people um, who are on this call today and many of the people um, uh, who are um, Patients at UNC, they hear about palliative care when they are newly diagnosed with Parkinson's. We we um, want to really share about that early and often because, as you talked about, this is an ongoing conversation, and we know that um, we want to know what um, what in what impacts and interests you now, and we want to know how that is going to change and evolve um, over the many, many, many years. So. Um, uh, thank you everyone for um, for attending today. Thank you for um, uh, joining in for this conversation. Thank you, Duan, for um, uh, all the, the work that you did to, to um, share with us today. And um, I hope that everyone will join us for our, our next monthly webinar in December. Um, mark your calendars. Uh, for um, December 15th, um, where we will be uh, learning about uh, Parkinson's disease and cannabis and CBD. So I hope you will join us for that one. Um, thank you everyone and have a great weekend. Thank you.